How are you? Good, mate. You all right? Yeah, all good. All good. Got the hang of Zwift life now? Yeah, I had a ramp test the other day. That was it? Yeah, it was right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, at one stage, my watts were 2,000. I was like, nah. <laughs> Solid work. I don't know what that meant, but um, yeah, no, it's fine. 2,000 average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rest. Is that still doing it, Tom? No, it's not doing it now, mate. I was signing as me, though, which is weird. I know. Also, I had a, like, whenever it records to the cloud and uh, goes up at uh, five past midnight, Talk Tuesday went recorded to the cloud, it said. It, five past midnight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you bother. A bit random. Very random. I think, uh, I think I'm one of those lucky ones who are getting hacked. Are you getting hacked by Rob Jones? Could be Rob Jones. He's right there. And Naj is just sitting outside in a buff post run, right? Yeah, I just finished my run. How was it? Oh, it's beautiful. It's a nice morning for sure. It's, it's so cool out yeah, there. Yeah, actually. It's really nice. <laughs> We need to benefit before the weather becomes really hot. <laughs> Take advantage, right? Yeah. And they did this grass area in the marina. It's new, actually, and it's really nice. Whereabouts is that? Is that just along from yours? <clears throat> yeah. It's like a small park. It's nice. Yeah. As Cap, Brixen, Craig, Jonesy, the silent, the silent whisper at four in the morning. <laughs> so I've just been hacking Tom's uh, Tom's Zoom and uploading it to the cloud. Good man. On midnight. <laughs> Five past midnight. <laughs> <laughs> Then they come. I'll share our cover slide so we look full pro. Oh. oh my goodness. How long were you working on that, mate? That is woof. That took me around two two uh, minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> would you say that's would you say that's sloping down or sloping up? It's Perspective, isn't it? Question Point of me. reference. Frame of reference. Where is George? I'm here. He's there. Oh, good. How you doing? Good night. The most annoying thing about Zoom, right, is that when you're on with your friends, there's a, an option to squiggle on the screen. So if you're doing a quiz, for instance, some people just go to town and the liberties and that. Is that your way of telling if you got friends? I was, yeah, it's really discreet, wasn't it? <laughs> there we go. You mean like that? Let's keep uh let's keep this clean, yeah. <laughs> 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 terrible on the recordings. All right. All right. 7.14. Shall we? We, we? shall. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Talk Tuesday. I want to say we're on 007. I've absolutely no idea. Today, we're a number. I think it's seven. Naturally progressing on from last week and we're talking zone three and we might know zone three as your more tempo type of zones, the burnout zone, the great zone, or middle of the road, 
training, which can lead to burnout syndrome or zone three syndrome. We will talk you through some questions today. Obviously, we had this on our story last week, and it's great you guys interact with us, and that's really nice to see. And so that helps us to form these chats as well to get a little bit more information across to you. So that's what we're going to do today. And then just like last week, we'll open it up to some questions at the end and hopefully we can answer them for you. So to introduce you a little bit more to zone three training, we can look at it in a few different areas, which we will do now. So obviously we're sticking to swim, running and biking, being uh, the endurance team that we are. If we're swimming, we we'd never really use heart rate max or heart rate itself within swimming. But if we were to, it would be around 7 to 80% of your maximum heart rate for swimming. And for those that know their critical swim speed, all the runners are looking at this right now, thinking what the hell is CSS? Critical swim speed is your threshold speed for swimming. So that, that lines up the same as lactate threshold pace or FTP for a, a runner or a cyclist. And we'd have that at around plus five, say five seconds. So if you're critical swim speed is 130, then your tempo or zone three is gonna be 135. For runners, as we know from uh, watching the story last week, they are looking at around 7 to 80% of their max heart rate as well. And that is 90 to 94% of their lactate threshold heart rate, which is different to max heart rate, remember? And around 90 to 94% of their lactate pace as well. For the cyclists, most of us know from this zone within FTP of 75 to 89%, lactate threshold heart rate is the same as running, minus 1%, and heart rate max, we're a little bit higher, we're looking at 75 to 82% of your heart rate max. On an RPE scale of one to 10, we are looking for around a six to seven, so you might hear this term used comfortably hard quite a lot, um, that is what zone three training is. And that's actually probably the reason a lot of people bash zone three training is because it's, it is comfortably hard. So it's something that we can do for quite a sustained period of time, but it's not actually giving as much in return. So we always hear within endurance training, you either want it to be really, really easy or really, really hard or comfortably hard sits in the middle of that which is one of the reasons why zone three is a difficult zone to work around. Fueling wise, we're mainly using a carbohydrate source when we're fueling zone three. Once we get to around 75% of your threshold heart rate, you start to dramatically turn your fuel source to carbohydrate. You can be anywhere from 10 to 30% um, at 75%, you can be any burning fat for around 10 to 30% of your total calories being burned. So really not that much if we think it's probably about 90% of your fuel is coming from carbohydrates when you're working in zone three. That obviously depends on a few things like environmental factors and how efficient you are at utilizing fat for fuel, but mainly it's carbohydrates. The other one is working around this area which a lot of cyclists or the you triathlon guys who know around cycling what this means sweet spot this is a zone within your power zones that's around 89 up to 93 percent or some people 87 up to 93 percent and zone three makes up 46 percent of that sweet spot zone so that's something to think about as well when we're doing zone three training is where are you in that sweet spot area and not going over into the threshold side of sweet spot as well. And this will all make a little bit more sense as we go on through this presentation. Tom, can I just check something? Is, um, is everyone else's screen? Because my screen hasn't moved from the first slide. Yeah, either. same here. Yeah. Oh, really? Please. Well, it's moving on my screen. <laughs> Sorry, I, would, I was going to interrupt before, but I put it in the chat. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, again.
Okay, are we seeing now? Yeah. And that? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Does what I said all make sense a bit more now? <laughs> yeah, that's better. <laughs> Much better, yeah. Thank you. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll so leave everyone, you, needs, uh, everyone needs to screenshot that quickly and then we'll move on. Can you, can you start at the start? <laughs> to absorb the information. <laughs> can we get some nice weight music going on, please? <laughs> Elevator stuff. Elevator. On. So I don't I know some of you take notes. We're gonna move on in five. Get a countdown clock. Two. Next. Are we seeing that? No. You're joking. No, it's not changed. <laughs> Yeah, now we can see it. Now you, you can see that you came out and it's, it's gone into the next slide. All right, well, we're playing this game then. All right, so developing zone three or how we measure progress is very, very simple. And it's the same as we measure in, in the other zones as well. So we're looking at work rate and output. So imagine this green line to be, let's go with runners. Imagine this is your pace line and you are running in a pace zone of zone three. This red line is gonna be your output. So we're gonna call this heart rate. And as we can see, that is in zone three until we get to about 35 minutes. And then it's creeping up into zone four. However, your work is staying the same. So we don't want to see, or we can measure that as being a turnover point at around 35 minutes. Let's say that's in week one of your zone three development training. When we look at, the next graph, which we could say maybe is week three of your zone development training. Now we can see that your pace is staying in zone three and your output, so your heart rate, is also staying in zone three all the way up to 50 minutes. Who knows how long it stayed in zone three as you went on. We're always likely to see a heart rate drift if, if we're looking at heart rate. Um, but what we can do is measure how quickly it takes for that drift to come in. And that's how we're basically measuring your development. Other ways is we can look at where this pace line sits within zone three and how that feels. So if you're running, say your zone three pace is roughly 430 per K, um, week one, that might feel really, really hard to sustain. And, and we can see that through your heart rate effort. Week two, it might feel a bit easier. And week three, you might feel like it's almost too easy. So your RPE, your rate of perceived exertion has dropped below that six to seven factor, which is why it's really important for you guys to be feeding back on your training peaks, not just with comments, but also those smiley faces and the numbers. So that as coaches, we can see how it felt as much as how it looked as well, especially with the hot conditions coming in now, we start to lose a lot of reliability through your heart rate more or less just through heart rate really, but also through your perceived effort as well. So it's really important you feedback on that. If you're looking for like a, from a cyclist standpoint, it's pretty much the same as uh, running with pace, but obviously power within cycling is a true measure of your input to the bike. So it gives us a nice, a bit more of an accurate read on your data over pace, because obviously that's affected by hills, wind, environment, things like that. So that's how we measure, measure progress, essentially, is once you've got an accurate test, you then just look at where you line up within those zones and how long you can keep your working and uh, work input and work output aligned within the same zone, and, and that measures the development. Next, Rob Jones is going to answer how much we should be training in zone three. Thank you, Tom. Um, <laughs> So we call zone three the gray zone or the zone that people tend to want to avoid, but that's not necessarily the case. So the question was put to us, what percentage should you be training in zone three? And to be honest, it completely depends on what your goals are. Um, if you're racing anywhere longer than two to three hours, but sort of roughly less than six to seven, I've, I've just put an arbitrary number on that. Don't treat that as concrete. You're probably racing in the zone three um spectrum so i've taken some examples marathon 
uh, half marathon, half Ironman distance. Most of those are probably zone three efforts. Case in point, if we look at my rack half marathon that I ran in February just gone, it was one hour, 24 minutes. And one hour, 16 of that was um, zone four. So just below that number. Um, if we look at Tom Walker's Dubai Marathon in 20, what year was it this year? 2020, 2019. Skinny beat you though, unfortunately. If you look oh, at your I, marathon. <laughs> what's this three? It was 2.53. I went from training peaks, mate. So if we look at your marathon in from training peaks in 2019, you spent 40 minutes in zone three um, and one hour 53 in zone four. So you're pushing quite hard in that distance. But then if we look at my 10K PB um, that we did at the Shakeside Road Run when I was chasing you and Marcus, it was 38 minutes high zone four. So there's a very fine line between what races you're doing and what effort you're actually putting out. So the efforts need to be slightly longer for you to actually be maintaining that zone three. And if you're pushing hard enough, you'll probably be in zone, into zone four. Exceptions to this, if you're a novice, if you're new to running, if you're just starting running again, you're going to find it very, very hard to maintain that zone three um, within that zone three range for long periods. So you're going to need to train it at some stage. If you train it, you'll become better at it. It's simple as... Lots of the pro triathletes will race their entire Ironman distances. So they'll spend eight to nine hours in zone three. So they spend a lot of time training in that zone as well. Walker. Next. Next. So the fuss around zone three um, and why people bang on about it so much. If you don't race in that heart rate zone, then training in that heart rate zone is a little bit a waste of time if you spend most of your time racing in zone two then you should be training zone two if you spend most of your time raining uh, training in the upper zones then you be, should be spending plenty of time training the upper zones um as tom called it we call it comfortably hard i call it happy hard so you you finish a session you've got a good feeling of accomplishment um sessions are challenging but you could keep that intensity going. You're, you're dripping with sweat afterwards. You feel like you've had a really, really good workout. Um, you tend to get this sort of zone data profile from guys that go and do big group runs with um, people like Adidas runners, for example, where they'll start off nice and easy and the pace will just go a little bit faster, a little bit faster, a little bit faster, and the heart rate will just keep climbing and climbing and climbing. So they're not monitoring it as well as they should be. Um, I suppose the question is, if you're not racing at this intensity, then have you achieved anything that's race specific in terms of your race fitness if you're racing at that zone? Not necessarily if you're racing at zone four, zone five. So if your race is 5K, why would you train zone three? Why would you not train zone four, zone five? Um, that said, lots of our athletes and lots of you guys will probably train zone three or do lots of tempo runs and why it's really simple it's it's good for building muscular endurance um and you can recover faster than if you're smashing track sessions every week so obviously the intensity is slightly lower you can recover a little bit faster so it does have its benefits but one thing to remember is obviously specificity so training intensity should mirror what your race is going to be like or what your event is going to be like so zone three in tempo work has its place, but as you're getting closer to your race event, your training should look more like that race event. If you're about to do a multi-stage ultra in three weeks, you shouldn't be hitting tempo work every other day. You should probably be doing nice and easy zone two, easy running, perhaps on different terrain styles that mimic what you're going to race on. So again, it's like what we said yesterday. Um, what percentage should be in zone three? There's no concrete answer. It's very, very dependent on who you are, what your race goals are, how fit you are, and what you're wanting to achieve out of your running. Perfect. Next up, George, how okay. do we know training zones? Yeah, so my question was, what came in on Instagram was how to know my training zones. Um, and yeah, so the basically the only way you need to set them um, you can do a lactic threshold heart rate test, which your coach can set you, or you can do something similar. You can take the same data 
uh, from something like a 10K road race, which would be flat. You just need to make sure you complete a good warm up before you start it because uh, it needs to be an honest best effort. So an honest like going for a PB and make sure you do have your heart rate strap up. So from that, your coach can take the data and we can find out this next slide, what your zones are. So in order for you to know which zone you're in, there's a few different things there that I've written down. So all different zones. Obviously today we're talking majority about zone three, but I'll just quickly go over all five zones. Uh, so zone one is less than 85% of your lactic threshold heart rate. Zone two is 85 to 89% of your lactic threshold heart rate. So that's what we spoke about last week. So your aerobic zone. And then what we're talking about today, which is the tempo zone. So that's 90 to 94% of the lactic threshold heart rate. And then we've got zone four, which is what you would be running around a 5K or a 10K. That's 90 to 99, uh, sorry, 95 to 99% of that to threshold heart rate. And then when we're doing the short, fast sprint work into zone five, known as the full gas zone, that's 100 or more percent of that lactic threshold heart rate. So to give you a quick example of how it would look for an athlete, I've actually made a little slide to just give you an example athlete. So these are the heart rates you can typically see. They would be around this, but obviously every single athlete is different. And in order to get these, you would need to do this test. So either the lactic threshold heart rate test or something similar like the 10K. Uh, so I've given an example athlete here. So zone one, which would be the recovery zone. You're looking up to, this athlete is looking up to 137 beats per minute from zero. Zone two, between 138 and 145. Zone three, 146 to 153. So that's this zone, this tempo zone. And then zone four, 154 to 162. Zone five, 163 onwards, full gas zone. All right, so that's how you get it. You, you, there's no way to get it unless you do these tests. So either the 10K or the lactic threshold heart rate test. All right, so you probably see these, if you go back, Tom, if you go back to that uh, first slide with the Garmin. So, so many people have this, but they don't know these colors. These different colors are the different zones. So as you can see, it's showing there that this person, whoever is, this watch is, they're sat in the aerobic zone. So they're sat in the zone two. The next one up, it will change color and it will show you which zone you're in. So you can actually set these on the watch and you can speak to your coach and they can help you do that. Perfect. Is half of mine missing? What is that? It's missing, uh, okay, sorry about that. It's missing uh, three little dots below the benefits versus potential dangers. So they are end of base phase, specific event preparation and timing, which relate quite nicely to the little the pictures we've got there. So my question was, when is it optimal to include zone three training? And I broke this down into five little different sections. <clears throat> so, so to somebody who wants to include it all the time, and who says they are time crunched in terms of they only have four to five hours, then optimization of your training is important. However, it doesn't really hold true if you've got a goal in mind that is of a, of a time that zone three doesn't really affect. So zone three, as we've pretty much said throughout this, um, this talk, is the fact that it is aerobic still but it is just a bit more hard intensity. So it takes a little bit more time to recover from. So that's always worth bearing in mind. So if you've got five sessions a week, then the time crunched well, runner, cyclist, triathlete is probably better off doing the zone two work and getting the full benefit aerobically and then doing the hardest stuff and being able to go a bit faster. So just as Tom and uh, Rob and George have said throughout, um, does time crunch matter? Mm. Not really. Not if you're, you've got a goal in mind, you want to be specific and actually achieve your goals. Um, benefits and potential danger, dangers, again, we've, we've talked about this. So benefits can include um, increased aerobic leg strength, muscular endurance. Um, you're less likely to fatigue towards the end of a long race, so like a seven or eight hour race, then you're, you're, uh, fatigue, you're fatigue resistant, as we say. And it's also been shown that fast switch firm, the type two A's become a lot more efficient. So you've got your type ones, which are aerobic, your big powerhouses and um, mitochondria that, or muscle fiber type, sorry, that, that create the energy. And then you've got the, the fast switch, so the type two A and two type two, type two B. Um, type A 
can become more oxidative and produce and use um, oxygen to produce energy. So they become a little bit more efficient. So that's, that's a good point. Dangers are typically people do overcook it. So they just do a few too many sessions there and they get stuck. But a lot of people give it a bad, bad press. In terms of like optimizing when you actually implement zone three, because there are benefits to be had and they are good for races that are over that three hour, two hour mark um, and below about nine hours. So towards the end of your base phase, so as long as you've prepared properly and spent enough time training your aerobic system to handle the stress and becoming efficient at using oxygen, then towards the end of a uh, base phase, is looks to be a good good point to put it in because you do develop that um, fatigue resistance and also you increase your in, um, muscular strength and endurance so it's a little bit higher intensity but you get a lot more benefit from it and um, so if you just dabble that in towards the end of a base phase then you you finish that phase off as it were and then as rob has just been talking about the uh, specific event prep so I've got a picture there of Mr. What's his name? Gomez in two different guises. So one of them is doing an Olympic triathlon where he completes that in about an hour and 50, an hour and 52. And then his Ironman and 70.3 distances where he does it like, I think it does Ironman in eight hours and a half, I think. So when he's training for a Olympic, he's not going to be bothering too much with zone three because he's barely going to be in it. He's going to be zone four for the majority of that hour and 50. He's going to be full gas. Whereas in the Ironman, the longer distance, he needs to get more habitually used to training and working within zone three. If you were to look at a cyclist, it would be good because in cycling in a race, for example, a six to seven hour race, you've got a lot of surges um, which go into zone four to zone five, like big where like the events selections made. So for example, a little hill for three minutes can go up to zone five, but then they come back down. They don't ease off the gas. They usually sit in zone three within the peloton or a small breakaway. So being able to recover and also work within that um, zone three is really important. And as Tom was saying, um, your sweet spot is included in zone three. So it's a pretty important thing to, to optimize in terms of efficiency. So getting towards your event, if your event is specific to that and training that system and making sure you're happy there and fueling and sitting within that is, is pretty important. And then timing. So at the bottom, and um, we've talked about it a little bit, but timing basically making sure at the end of, end of base phase, so little the little blue bars, that's your base period. If you look at your annual training plan or your, your yearly plan, whatever you want to call it, um, you'd look towards the end of the blue section to add a bit of volume, a bit of intensity, and just make sure that recovery time's better. And then the little orange um, block, which has got A at the top of the cup, that's basically your A race. So as you approach your A race, you want to basically be working in and around whatever race situation you're going to be in. So if it's an Ironman or it's a 70.3, then you'll be spending a lot of time in your sweet spot or your tempo zone here. Um, and that, I think that pretty much covers me for when's it optimal. Um, yeah, Tomo? Yeah, I think there's some, some really good points there. It's, it's one of those things that because it, it feels such a nice place to be training, like that happy hard comfortably hard place it's hard to sort of understand why it's why it's not great to be in it all the time and i think the, the main thing to get across is that it it gets a bad rap because you're kind of you're damaging the system not enough to need like a lot of recovery but enough that you do need some but you don't feel like you do and this is why yeah programs like the 8020 or the polarized training methods and things work so well it's because you're either way under it or you're way over it and so people do get scared of including it into their into their training but as we've discussed it definitely has a place but it does need to be pretty specific of when you do do it because it will beat your body up 
quite hard, especially if you're doing events that are going, you know, like your half Ironmans or your, your Ironman stuff. Like the training blocks for that are long. You know, Big, it's, not, right. it's not a six week or a, an eight week dial in. They tend to be like a three month really solid training block. And so you're spending a lot of time. And, and as we saw from the beginning, you're relying mainly on carbohydrate as fuel for it. So you're depleting your body day in, day out, which means you have to refill it, which is where I get a little bit lazy sometimes with choosing the easier carbohydrates to get hold of, your sweets, your fast foods, things like that. And so it's just not, a, a, not the healthiest zone for your body to be, be in. So when it comes time to really train those areas, it's important you know why, and it's important you know what you look for and that you are actually in the right area of training to make sure you get the most out of zone three. Otherwise, you'll just slowly cook yourself and you'll never go really, really hard and you'll never go too easy. So you're never really building a solid base and an oxidative energy system. And then you're never really going hard enough to be working really well at above threshold, which you need in order to perform well within races. We'll touch more on zone four, obviously, next week and why that is important to have. But it, it mainly is because you want zone three and zone two to be as big as possible so that you don't slip in and out of them into, into threshold or below into lesser zone as well. Let's open up to questions if possible. Who's got any, anyone need more information or clarification? There's quite a lot of information comes over. <laughs> So hello, what? Do you want to take the, the PowerPoint down, mate, so we can see people's faces in case they're holding their hands up? Who's holding their hand up? I said if. I didn't say is. I can see who's sleeping. <laughs> Busted. I think quite a good question. I'll ask you, Rob Jones. Mm -hmm. Since, um, you know, you, you used to do with quite a lot of uh, CrossFit and then got more serious into running over the past two years or so. How have you watched your zone three develop? Good question. So whenever, whenever I was doing CrossFit and just running, all my runs were really, really low intensity. And I used my CrossFit as the majority of my high intensity. So my runs would be um, just really sort of basic zone one zone two work trail runs so longer longer easy stuff um and then maybe the odd track session but that was rare whenever i was doing the full crossfit program um i never really to be honest i never really looked at zone three then as a thing um effectively what i was doing my crossfit was my zone three training did it transfer over to running it made me deal with being able to hurt at the upper zones for sure um but in terms of adding benefit to my long runs and stuff not so much <laughs> um whenever i then transitioned over to full running i added in a lot more tempo work um and obviously then was able to increase my my lower end aerobic work as well and then also train so much more at the upper end that gave me so much more benefit than hitting that middle zone um and then i look at my training now as well and i look at how much time i actually spend in that zone three area and to be honest i most of my runs are either at one end or the other i spend very little time in the middle um and most of that time if i do is more transitional than anything um and then yeah so looking again looking at that half marathon that i did in february that was one hour 24, one hour 16 of it was all in zone four. Um, yes. I'd say five. I spent, <laughs> I, spent, <laughs> I spent eight minutes in zone three. Um, and again, you know, my, the 10K that we did on Sheikh Zayed Road, that was 38 minutes in high zone four. Um, so nothing. <laughs> nothing in zone three um, yeah you guys are running in front of me just shouting back are you all right and like <laughs> um yeah so i mean there's yes i do some tempo efforts that maybe transition from zone two and then dip into zone three but that's more to get the feeling 
of what that pacing is like. So if I push the pace up a little bit, then my heart rate will drift, but it doesn't quite, the, maybe the efforts aren't long enough to be hitting that high heart rate yet. Um, so you might do, you know, you might do 1K intervals at your 10K pace or your half marathon pace, for example, and your heart rate will drift up into that zone three. Um, maybe it won't hit zone four yet because you're not running at that pace for long enough. And then when you recover, it'll go back down. So you're more stimulating the pacing than necessarily the heart rate zone, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's, it's a really interesting zone um, in, in the tempo. How, uh, like just what you were saying, Rob, um, picking up that, that feel of it. Mm. I know it's a strange thing, but finding a rhythm within it. Uh, a, little, a little anecdote is that in, in a 10, when this, this bloke, gets all his runners together when they're like really young. Basically, he judges them on how they run at tempo. So he gets them on a track and he just sets them off at tempo. Obviously, it's all relative. Um, but he gets them in heart rates, gets heart rate strap on, and he watches how they run within tempo. So like comfortably uncomfortable and says it's really important to find their rhythm and their like style within the running. So I think it's... Physiologically, yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a bit of a dancing with the devil, but stylistically and how you run kinematically is also quite important. Yeah, I think it, you say it like that, it's, it's dancing with the devil. You're if you are doing a lot of zone three work, your recovery has to be really, really good, and so you yeah. can't rely on just having some easy runs and, and easy bikes here and there to recover. You have to go a little bit more out of your way you have to eat that little bit better you have to get that little bit more sleep you know got to take naps in the day something i experienced for my build this year in south africa was it was just relentless of zone <laughs> and it wasn't enough to rely on you know you could just sleep well and and eat a little bit more like i had to really go out of my way to make sure that i was recovering and definitely having naps in the day <laughs> yeah but, um the the key for me was like uh, you touched on there, mate. Was understanding what it what it feels like, and you'd be amazed. You might feel rubbish for the first two hours, but then hour three, four, five, you can feel something comes back into your legs. Your your neuromuscular system gets on board with what you want to do, and you really feel strong again. And it only is time spent in in zone three, which is what you're really going to be racing in, is what what helps that. Um, so it's, it's such a difficult one because it does get such a bashing, but when you get your head around it and how it works, then you can help yourself recover so much more with it. Because a lot of times people will finish like a zone three work and think, I didn't really work that hard. So I don't need to like refuel that much. But as we know, you're mainly using carbohydrate as a fuel source. So you have to like refill like you've done a hard threshold session. And yeah. That bit wrong. Mate, I want to ask you, uh, Rob Foster's, from uh, looking at cycling data, if someone's zone three power isn't matching up with a zone three heart rate, what could be a few reasons behind that? Uh, that the well, the first one that would jump out if their power, power to heart rate in zone three isn't matching up is that they haven't developed their aerobic system enough, so there's a massive dip, like disparity. So. It could be like this excessive decoupling going on or on the bike and the heart rate shooting up. Classic ones are hydration and fueling, but also maybe they've got their, their power, their heart rate, they haven't changed on training peaks. So they're taking their running heart rate as opposed to their cycling, which is a, <laughs> it's a classic. <laughs> if you have just taken up cycling, um, Keep an eye on your power if you're on a, a static bike and then have a look at your heart rate. And if it's call it, saying something that it shouldn't say, so if it's not pairing up, so if you're not zone three power to heart, zone three heart rate, have a look what settings you've got it set to in training peaks because that sometimes can throw up a little spanner. But in terms like, yeah, so muscular endurance, if it's, you need to revisit your zone two work if you're, 
zone three work isn't pairing up, if you're not capable of sustaining those longer efforts, then the drift will occur because it's you're too stressed. It's yeah. I was gonna say I was gonna say as the temperature starts ramping up as well, the um I suppose almost like the, the draw on people is they want to maintain the same pace that they've been running at in the winter, which yeah. just won't be sustainable. So your heart rate is going to drift into that zone three if you're trying to still hold five minute, 430 Ks, whatever it might be. Um, and you'll want to run at that pace because that pace feels good. But as the temperature ramps up, you're going to have to run just slower to hit those aerobic zones. Otherwise, you're going to get into that dead zone really, really, or dead zone, gray zone really, really quickly. Um, and you're going to lose some of the benefit of your training. Yeah, I think that's quite hard for people to understand is whether you're working with zone three from a physiological standpoint, so using your heart rate, or whether you're using it from a pacing and work output standpoint, which is obviously pacing. I think if you have a, a set goal of a time you want to achieve in a race, then sometimes you have to focus on your pace and kind of forget your heart rate numbers and get your legs and your body used to running at, at that certain pace because that's essentially what's going to get you to your goal of the time in a race. But if we're looking for the adaptations that zone three gives us physiologically, then you've got to just kick pace out the window and, and just focus on, on your heart rate and the feel of it because end of the day, pace can be um, affected by so many other things. So it's quite important if you're not sure, if, if it is saying zone three and you're not sure which zone you want to be looking at, then make sure you understand what the point of that, that run is. Because if it's to do with pacing and you can't hold yourself into that zone, then something big time needs to be rethought. Whereas with heart rate zones, you can normally hold it. You just have to get rid of your ego and either slow down, sometimes speed up or uh, try and choose a, a flatter route that's another thing is if you're doing a lot of varied terrain it's a lot harder to hold yourself within certain zones so you'll be you'll be knocking in and out um similar to the the way rob said about temperature i've got one more question and it's this can go to george or rob you might have some some data on this rob jones when guys are doing sessions like ultra legs or you know crossfit type training we tend to be that tends to be around a comfortably hard effort. So you're working hard enough to obviously be, uh, to be moving things and working muscular endurance quite a lot, which sits in nicely with zone three. Do you see a lot of the time heart rate data coming back, mainly being in zone three when you're doing like your OCR sessions, George, or your ultra legs, Rob? Yeah, I'd say the guys, it, you do see a lot of the drift. And I think that's, again, just getting back to doing the aerobic work a lot more. Um, it will, I would say 70% of most guys, uh, the, the, the run data, if they're coming, doing an obstacle, then going for a run, I'd say 70% of those runs would be in zone three, but by the end they would end up drifting into zone four. But I guess that's the whole finish strong mentality that the guys are having, especially you see it at classes a lot. Everyone, it's a bit of a race, you see. So and it's the same that would happen in a race as well. If you had anything left in the tank, most people would drift into zone four by the end because they don't want to have anything left. So um, but yeah, I'd say the majority for sure is 70%. They'll definitely be in zone three. I don't know about you, Rob. Um, I'm just pulling up my ultra legs data now and the bulk of it for the last four sessions, I have not jumped out of zone two. So clearly not working hard enough. Well, that's I mean, obviously. You could look back at some time, you know, when you started ultra legs, when you weren't as fit or conditioned. Yeah what was actually happening. So that could be a quite an interesting way of developing um, ultra legs or athletes who are doing ultra legs is looking at the heart rate data of, of when they are doing it and seeing that they've actually now doing the same work. So whatever a hundred step ups or whatever ultra legs is that day, probably more like 500 step ups and where the heart rate sits in that. I think it's very dependent on the session as well, depending on what we've programmed. Um, so lots of the sessions are, I mean, back last year, um, the ultra leg sessions were a lot more high intensity because they're all gym based and very, very obviously community feel and there's a lot more um, speed work with longer rest times because we were doing it from the gym. But now it's sort of gone from home. You could argue that potentially the ultra leg sessions are maybe slightly easier or people are doing them at slightly less intensity because they're training on their own. Mm. 
That's a good point. There's one more um, question that I get asked quite a lot around zones, and that is where your math zone lines up within the zoning systems that we use. Um, it tends to be that the a lot of people like sort of younger end of the spectrum. So we're talking uh, like 35 or below math heart rate tends to line up with zone three. Uh, so they think math should be aerobic and therefore, but now I'm lining up with zone three. I thought it would be zone two. It's not really making sense. Um, my answer to this usually is they're two completely separate things. So math with your zoning system doesn't really work. We use math, the Maffetone method, which is 180 minus your age. We use that as a very simple, basic marker to make sure that you guys are running or cycling in aerobic zones. It was a method um, originally from health. So it was basically, we can estimate that you're going to be in an aerobic heart rate if we take 180 and we minus your age. That's how he developed that formula through collecting lots and lots of data. And then it was more or less how we've just shown you how you develop zone three was he says, if you always go and exercise at, at this intensity, we can watch pace either get faster or maybe decrease. And then we'll manipulate different areas of your life through nutrition, through mindset, um, through different mechanics, um, strength. And then we've always got that one basic marker of knowing that your heart rate is the same. And then we're adjusting things to watch what pace does around it. So that's how the Mafto method was developed. He developed it more from a standpoint than anything else. The zoning system is, is completely different to it. So you're basically getting more detail out of a zoning system. It does sometimes line up with your zone three work though, but I would just say try and ignore that fact. And the reason you're being given a math run is mainly just to make sure you keep it easy and you have a more of a, a wider range to play with. Whereas when you're giving zoning system runs, it's so you're specifically working different areas of your aerobic system, whereas math tone just is aerobic. Your zoning system, you've got three different zones of three different areas of your aerobic system to be using. So they're, they're very different and uh, try not to compare them. Any questions, guys? We've, we've talked out there. Who's taking notes? Dana, obviously. <laughs> I've just, uh, I just, whilst you were talking there, I just looked back at my ultra legs data from last year. So summer previous 2019, and there was a lot more zone three work, but then the sessions I dipped into zone three, it wasn't the strength work that was dipping into zone three. It was whenever we jumped on the rower, the ski erg or the assault bike. That's what was sending my heart rate up. Everything Just else the thought of it. The, uh, the last point on all of this, guys, is it's obviously quite heart rate led unless you're using power or, or pace. So make sure we were chatting a little bit about this in the, in the coaches group, but the, like monitor what's going on. So some days your strap might be faulty. It might have a low battery. It might have moved. It might have slipped. It might have gone. You might be reading off your watch heart rate. And so you've got to have that working correctly before you make assumptions about what is going on with your heart rate. And that's where it comes back to just feeling what these zones are. So you know if heart rate fails, you know how it should be. So zone one, very conversational, barely working. Zone two, you should still be able to breathe in through your nose and out through your nose and it should be conversational. Zone three, you should be able to still speak quite comfortably, but you might need to take a breath every now and then. Zone four, not much talking at all. And zone five, definitely no talking. As summer hits, you'll be getting a lot more training based around feel and relying on you to be understanding where you are from just a feel point of view and not relying on your heart rate straps because as they get more and more wet and saturated with water, they just become even more unreliable. Yeah. Cool. It's important to, in, in the times that you do have a reliable set of heart rate data, it's also really important to be conscious of the fact that how that feels. 
So when you do take it away and it becomes less reliable, you've got more of a, a schema to use, more of an experience level. All right, guys, that's it. No questions coming in. So we shall leave you to it, eight o'clock. I hope you all have a great week. Start with a good Tuesday. We'll see you on Thursday morning for coffee chats. And then uh, we are launching the May challenge that day as well, right? Oh, Friday. No, Thursday. It's, what is it? I'm so confused. Friday. That's on Friday. 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 So you've got two days left to choose which challenge you want to do. You have some climbing options. Choose your mountain or you can choose your trail. You might want to do it all in zone three. Who knows? There are 16 options. So don't say we don't spoil you for choice. One thing you can do as well, if you're feeling extra, is choose your trail, but also cover the same elevation as that trail. Oh. Which is what Luke Nolan's going to do. <laughs> do any with... Uh, just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Have a great week. We'll see you all throughout it. See you guys. Ciao. See you later.